Welcome to the Distance Learning Session 7, the last session before we embark on the big seven-session task of looking at the Elgar Music Makers from next week. For this session we're looking at the Bainton Anthem and I Saw a New Heaven, which will become between Sadoc and the Music Makers in the programme of the Jubilee Prom. Many of you have sung this lovely piece before. It was in the last concert before I took over, but none of you will have done it in the orchestral version. This is an orchestration that I did about 30 years ago and which I've never yet heard. There have been a number of performances through the Bainton Society who keep a set of score and parts, but I've been never able to get to one and no one has ever made a recording. So I'm especially looking forward to conducting this, not just for my orchestration, but because it's one of my favourite pieces. It didn't quite make my desert island, but it would certainly be in my top 20. Luckily, Bainton was meticulous about marking in the breathing. Very simply, whenever he wants a breath in a part, he writes a rest. Simple. That saves us a lot of time, apart from wondering why other composers don't do it. But we do have, end note, do have to have end notes in exactly the place he specifies. In general, the piece needs to be very legato, but with very clear words. It's telling a story from Revelation, and some of the drama will be lost if the words are not clear. Also, every dynamic marked in should be strictly observed. For instance, at the foot of page one, there's a four-beat crescendo taking us all the way from P to MF. Don't underdo any of this expression. On page two, there are one or two notes worthy of comment. The E in the second bar of the page in the soprano is born to be flat. Sing the E as if it's about to go up to an F and make sure it's good and sharp. Meanwhile, the tenor's B flat in the second bar is tricky, but needs to be quite strong, not least because it makes a great clash with the A in the organ. First earth were pa. So make sure that B flat comes through the texture very well. In the second line of page two, uh, it's very exciting if the tenor and basses continue to crescendo right the way through the long note on John. Then everyone aim for the first syllable of city. And tenors and basses, don't be tempted to come off with the ladies when you sing city. On the first two lines of page three, every time someone sings an E, make sure it's good and sharp. Basically, all the way through this piece, we've got strange chords that use an E natural and a B flat at the same time. It's the sort of principal flavour thing of the harmony of this piece. And as soon as you get a B flat lurking, it makes the E naturals want to be flat. So don't let them be. Same thing goes for the second line where you have E's and F sharps. Those need to be good and sharp too. Page three, uh, line two, second bar. Watch carefully for the D on husband is on the half beat and in a new tempo. Bass is at the bottom of page three. This is a great bass moment. Crescendo early and then a strong forte on the word saying. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying. And don't phrase off saying as if it's a crotchet because it isn't. In the last bar of three, accent the first note of behold so that it's clearly heard behold and make sure the D is strong and together at the end of the word. Page four at the top, full two beats on men. Altos ignore the bottom D is there. They're just insurance against shrieky male altos in cathedral choirs. At the bottom of the page, be careful with the placing of the D on the word God. Tenors enjoy but do not oversing your big tune at the top of page five. The S is on tears and eyes exactly as it says, even though the bass breathing, breathing is different. At the bottom of the page, basses, although you are dimming, still grow a little bit to the D sharp on eyes. We all tears from their eyes, so that that comes through the harmony. All watch carefully as the tempo picks up in the last bar of this page. No help in changing the speed from the accompaniment here. And here is a very gradual crescendo in all parts from the last bar of page five all the way to the first bar 
uh, of the last line of six. So keep that building, but don't build too soon. That bar, first line, uh, first bar of the bottom line of page six, is the climax of the whole piece, probably a little bit more than forte at the start of that line. In the last bar but one, again, sopranos watch out for a good, sharp E natural. The last page is poco, poco, a tranquillo, peaceful, but not slower. Tenors, last two notes of the top line. That B entry really wants to be an A, and often is with not very good church choirs, so be very careful to pitch a B there. It is in the organ part, but there's an A there as well. And in the last phrase, no breath, or at least not one that anyone notices. Tenors in particular may have to stagger. And come off with me at the very end. A single straggler could spoil the impact of the end of the piece. So, now you have the videos to work with. Thanks again to Michael, to Ruth Massey and my colleague Tristan Moore for recording for us. Ellie Martin, believe it or not, has just started work as a social worker and has little time now. She's still doing Mansfield, however, I'm pleased to say. The soprano on this recording and also on the forthcoming Elgar once is Ruth Provost, the wife of Paul, our boss at the Minster Choir, and a pretty amazing soprano who sings with lots of choirs like the Sixteen. Again, you can hear all the parts together or select your own part on its own. I hope you enjoy rehearsing and singing the Bainton. Next week is the first of seven sessions on sections of the Music Makers. <laughs>